Welcome back! In a recent mailbag I featured these AZ Delivery FT232RL USB to TTL serial adapters card here, link in the description. And now I want to have a closer look at these things. Talking about having closer looks, let's have first one on the board. So the main attraction here is of course the FTDI FT232RL chip. And somehow AZ Delivery got FTDI to do their custom stamp here on the chip. And it's called an FTDI232-AZ for AZ Delivery. Besides the FTDI chip, there's not much going on here. You have one, two, three LEDs with one, two, three series resistors, each 1K. You have one, two, three capacitors. These two are filtering the five volt USBs. I don't know what that thing does. And you have a zero ohm jumper resistor here. Of course, there's a little USB connector and on the other side a little pin header with the most important serial signals. We already had a look at those in the mailbag video. You also have a jumper here that you can use to switch between 5 volts and 3.3 volt logic level. Please note the 3.3 volts are internally generated by the FTDI chip from the 5 volt USB supply here. And that FTDI chip is not specified as a voltage regulator. So uh, the 3.3 volt rail is really not intended to supply something else but the chip itself. Though it might be okay to draw a few milliamps out of here. Also note, there is absolutely no polyfuse here on that board limiting the current drawn from the USB port. So be careful if you short out that 5 volt rail here, which should be connected directly to the USB 5 volt rail. By the way, that VCC pin switches with the jumper between 5 and 3.3 volts. And while we're talking about these through holes here, they are ideal to solder in your own vertical pin header and simply plug that into a breadboard. <laughs> that was the main reason I bought these things. And that's how it looks like with vertical pin headers soldered in on a breadboard. By the way, desoldering that little pin header here at the back was a pain in the behind, I ended up snipping off the plastic parts piece by piece and desoldering each pin individually. Before we finally connect that thing to a PC and do some real world stuff, let's go over its different pins. And this pin out here is from a data sheet that was sent to me by ASAT Delivery via email after I ordered it on Amazon. Uh, nothing to write home about, just that nice pin out here and uh, some more pages how to connect that to an Arduino or to a Raspberry Pi and some maximum ratings. The rest here, the additional information I got from the FTDI data sheet for the FT232R. So you have of course your RX and TX pin here for your serial interface. And you also have a LED out RX and TX. Please note there's already an RX and TX LED here on the board. You also have a lot of the RS232 control lines here. So data carrier detect, data set ready, ring indicator control, request to send, data terminal ready and clear to send. There are your power pins, so two times ground, then your power output VCC 3.3 volts or 5 volts, select 
acceptable via that jumper, you have a direct access to the 3.3 volt rail generated by the chip. And according to the FTDI data sheet, you can draw a maximum of 50 milliamps out of that. And you have a direct connection here to the five volt rail of the USB bus. Again, no polyfuse here. You also have two USB power control pins here and you can use these to make any connected peripherals here USB power management compliant. So the power enable goes low after the USB enumeration has taken place. So the computer has recognized the connected USB device and it goes high during USB suspend mode. The sleep pin just goes low during USB suspend mode. Finally, we have that test enable pin here. According to the FTDI datasheet, that should be pulled down to ground during normal operations. However, it seems to be dangling in the wind here and uh, bird works anyway. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that. All I.O. pins can normally drive up to 4 milliamps and that's from the FTDI datasheet. But there's also a high current mode available and then they can drive up to 12 milliamps. And that's set via a EEPROM setting inside that little chip. Also via the EEPROM you can tell your computer how much current the board will uh, draw at maximum from your 5 volt USB supply. And the default setting is just 90 milliamps. We will have a look at the EEPROM settings in just a second. Absolute maximum ratings. I opens maximum 24 milliamps. Yeah, you never reach that normally. Uh, voltage at the I opens minus 0.5 to VCC plus 0.5 volts and maximum power dissipation is 500 milliwatts for the whole thing. Keep that in mind if you draw out a lot of current. Now with all that theory under our belt, let's connect that thing to my notebook and have a look at the EEPROM using the FTDI FTPROC utility. Now, that's the FTDI FT PROC utility. I put a download link to the FTDI website in the description. So we can scan out here for devices and we find our device here. Wonderful. And you got all these stuff here, information, chip details, USB device descriptor. Yeah, don't fumble around with that if you don't know what you're doing. USB config description and there we have, yeah, it's currently identified itself as bus powered as it should be. You can also have it self powered. And here we have that max bus power thing I talked about. USB remote wake up, pull down IO pins. Again, don't fumble around with that if you don't know what you're doing. The USB descriptors and some hardware specific stuff here. Um, again, refer to the data sheet before you change something here. Now for the bad news. Usually you would go here into your attributes and change that to 200 milliamps. And then you simply say program device. And it says programming is successful. But if you look again here <laughs> into the attributes, nothing, absolutely nothing changed. And you can rescan the device. Nothing. You can cycle the port of the device. Nothing. So, yeah, the only information I found about that phenomenon uh, is from the FTDI community board. And here somebody has a problem with such modules from a robot kit shop. 
the URL no longer exists, but uh, yeah, they give the tip, uh, cycle button, press, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in the end, they say it's a third party product. And this is not only a third party board, but it is yeah a custom version of the FT232RL made for ASAT delivery. And I strongly suspect that they have in the ROM a flag set something that prevents you from flashing the EEPROM because they don't want anybody to uh, mess up the little board and then they have to support it. Uh, however, the 90 milliamps, uh, that's a bummer, of course. Uh, we'll see how that works out. So, let's have a look at the timing of these USB power enable and sleep signals. When I plug that thing in, scope is in single shot, fire in the hole. Arr. Time scale is 100 milliseconds per division and vertically we have two volts per division. So yeah, first of all, all signals are at five volts. That's what I jumped on the board. The yellow trace here is the USB five volt power rail. So that was when I plugged that thing in. Blue is the power enable signal, which does something initially until finally after aboutish 500 milliseconds, returning to low, indicating we can now suck power from the USB port. And down here we have the sleep signal, which also initially does something and then goes high, indicating we are not in sleep mode. Let's do the same again, but the other way around. I'm triggering now from the power enable signal, rising edge, and I will put my notebook into standby. Ah, there it is. So here it is, power enable goes high, indicating we should no longer pull power from that USB port while yeah, five volts is still supplied. But I think in standby mode, you should not pull more than 2.5 milliamps. And our sleep goes low, indicating we go into our sleep mode. So uh, basically, and this is not quite correct, but yeah, roughly the sleep signal is just the inverse of the power enable signal and both are active low. Let's do that one more time, but signal level set via the jumper to 3.3 .3 volts. Ah. And signal levels are indeed at 3.3 .3 volts, so everything's working hunky-dory. Uh, one thing I didn't mention so far, the USB shield is connected to the ground of the module. Uh, that's something you might need to take into consideration depending on your circuitry. Finally, a real-world test. I've added my Ublox GPS module to the breadboard. It has already been featured in a mailbag card here, link in the description. And the thing ideally gets a five volt supply. It has a 3.3 volt low dropout voltage regulator on board, but its interface is strictly 3.3 volts. So I'm supplying it now directly with the five volt USB here, and I've jumped my module to 3.3 volt signal levels and connected the serial interface. And as you can see, I'm using here the Arduino serial monitor. It works just fine. I am getting here the data from the Ublox module. Great. So what's the verdict? And since I'm German, let's start with the negatives. First and most important, I wasn't able to use the FTDI FT proc utility to program the EEPROM of the chip. That FT232 chip is very powerful and very flexible, but uh, it's yeah, it's in a fixed mode here. You cannot change anything. 
especially it always communicates back to the host that it's drawing 90 milliamps max. So if you want to implement something here fully USB compliant that draws more than 90 milliamps from the USB port, you cannot do this. It probably will work, but it will not be fully USB compliant. Second, it doesn't have a 500 milliamp polyfuse on the USB 5 volt rail. So if you short out the 5 volt pin here to ground, you might damage your computer. Finally, third, and I haven't mentioned that before, but the FTDI datasheet recommends to put a ferrite bead here on the USB 5 volt rail to reduce EMI radiated back into your computer. Of course, that ferrite bead is missing. Now for the positives. At number one, of course, the form factor that really sits solid with the soldered in pin headers here on the breadboard. That's uh, for me especially important if you uh, have a cable that you <laughs> plug in and out of here. So yeah, mechanically no problem. Second, it works and is quite flexible. So you got the USB power management signals, you got a whole lot of RS-232 signals, you are able to switch between 3.3 volt and 5 volt signal levels, you get the 5 volt USB power rail out here and you get at an add-on just at 50 milliamps, but it's there a 3.3 volt power rail. Last but not least, third the price. So I cashed out a little over four bucks for that board here. And if you consider that if you buy an FT232RL chip from a reputable distributor, that chip alone will cost you more. So maybe five bucks or so. To wrap things up, this is really a nice USB to serial converter for breadboard work. Though I wouldn't probably use it for a real USB compliant product. Yeah, put it somewhere on a PCB as a module. Anyway, that's it for today. Till next time, bye.